Hello to you and welcome to Mondays with Mike. Uh, I'm Chief Meteorologist Mike Iskovitz and check this out. This is an amazing view from Hurricane Franklin. Now, you know, we could really admire these things. I, uh, I think, you know, when they're not threatening any land areas, this thing is like textbook. I mean, just take a look at some of the structure of this thing. A beautiful eye right in the middle. Um, we have a, a circular um, a, a shape to the eye. And then surrounding the eye, you have this area here known as the central dense overcast or the CDO, which also is roughly circular and symmetrical. And so with that in mind, this thing is very likely to become um, a Category 5 hurricane, I think, at some point today. Now, at this point, the only land area that is threatening is Bermuda. Uh, now, of course, you know, we look out for the people of Bermuda as well, but, you know, they deal with these things all the time every year, and the vast majority of the time they get, like, a glancing blow from this. And so at this point, it does look like it's pointed in their general direction, but should pass off toward the north. But the bottom line is, when we see storms like this, in a way, it is sort of a good thing because the purpose of hurricanes, really, the reason that hurricanes exist is to transfer energy from the equatorial regions to the poles. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, we know that the equator gets a lot more sunshine than the poles do, which is why the North Pole is very, very cold and the equator is very, very warm. Well, if you didn't have storms, that formed in the equator and moved northward, then you would just accumulate heat in the equatorial regions of the Earth, and it would get hotter and hotter and hotter there, and there would be no way to balance it out. Well, when we have hurricanes like this, it takes the energy from the warm water and brings it up into the atmosphere where the, the evaporated warm water rises into the cloud, and then it condenses, and when it does so, it actually releases heat which uh, is called the latent heat of uh, condensation. And so that helps to transfer and, uh, you know, and release some of that heat from the oceans. And so when we have big storms like this, it actually is in a way a good thing, especially if they don't hit land, because it's that much less energy that'll be available for storms later on in the season, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of a way to look at it, uh, as long as these things avoid hitting land, which it looks like this thing is going to do. So that is Hurricane Franklin, just absolutely breathtaking to look at. That was what we call the visible satellite imagery, which is my favorite, because visible is just like if you were um, uh, like from the space station kind of thing, and just looking at it with your naked eye you would see all the structure of the clouds and, and um, a lot more detail. This is called the infrared satellite imagery, and, and some people might think it's called infrared because it's red, you know? But that's not it. Infrared is measuring uh, waves of light that we can't see with our naked eye. Um, it's heat, and in this case, what the satellite does is it's looking for cold temperatures because the atmosphere gets colder the farther up you go and so the colder the cloud tops are the taller the clouds are and when we have really tall clouds like we have right there that means that uh, you have very heavy rain we see that in thunderstorms and the taller the clouds are generally the stronger the storm is going to be and so that's what we have going on with um, with this uh, Hurricane Franklin at this time. So it looks pretty impressive on the infrared uh, imagery. I think it looks even more impressive on the visible imagery. Um, and then as of uh, around uh, midday, we're looking at this thing becoming probably a Category 5 hurricane. And then from here, it moves off toward the north. And like I said, it'll give a glancing blow to Bermuda and then most likely just zip off the East Coast. Threats to the U.S.? mainly big waves crashing up against the coastline. Uh, and sometimes that, you know, can cause some big hazards. I mean, you have people that are going to be out there surfing, you know, uh, and they look forward to this kind of stuff. But it can be a hazard. You can get rip currents. You can get beach erosion. And so um, that those are some of the hazards that are going uh, to go along with this one. All right. We have another system 
in the Gulf of Mexico that goes by the name of Idalia. And this one has been sort of stuck down around Cozumel for the last couple of days, but it's going to start moving off toward the north here before very long. And what I have here are the uh, computer models. And so I have, you notice they're all very tightly packed. And so when the computer models are all close together, you can be much more certain about the forecast track of the center of circulation. Um, so this is like, this is the GFS model, which is the American. I have the UK Met, which is the United Kingdom model. I also have the Euro on here, which is the white line right there. That's the European model. So they're all locked in in the same location. And so at this point, we could be fairly confident that the center of circulation of Idalia is going to move there into that Big Bend region of Florida. But what's a concern here for me is that because, by the way, that part of Florida is when you look at the whole state is one of the most sparsely populated areas. There's not a lot there. There aren't any big cities there. And when they've gotten hit by hurricanes in the past, a lot of times there isn't that much, you know, widespread damage that happens. Not to say it won't happen with this one. Uh, but my concern right now is for, um, for Tampa. Because remember, last year, also with an eye storm, by the way, remember it was Ian, um, they were prepared and they had battened down the hatches and they had hunkered down and, you know, all of that stuff. And the storm ended up you know, moving, taking a jog to the east and moving into southwest Florida. And obviously the rest is history, very, you know, awful history with Hurricane Ian actually becoming briefly a Category 5 hurricane, making landfall as a very strong Category 4 and causing, you know, incredible amounts of destruction in the Fort Myers, Naples area. If you look at this storm, it really is going to pass pretty close to Tampa, St. Petersburg, which is a a huge metropolitan area. And in fact, is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Lots of people, as you know, have moved to Florida. That's one of the places they've moved. And so you actually have a really significant risk of, um, of seeing storm surge from this and also some high winds. And so again, here's a closer look at the, the models are depicting the center of circulation. Okay, just the middle. Now, if this thing forms into a strong hurricane, which it looks like it has a good chance of doing, then Tampa will end up here on that so-called dirty side of the circulation, which is the rainier side, the side that typically has the higher winds, the side that causes more storm surge. And so that really is a big concern. You have a lot of people there, uh, clear water, St. Petersburg, Tampa, and then all the way down the coastline, like Sarasota and down to Fort Myers, very populated. And then it may actually move across Florida, places like Orlando and Gainesville, before moving to Jacksonville, and then probably giving a soaking to parts of Georgia and the Carolinas. So this may turn out to be a big deal. Another bit of interesting information for you. So this is the eye storm, Idalia. There have been a lot of notorious and very damaging eye storms. So, of course, here in Houston, we had Ike. Uh, last year in Florida, they had Ian. Uh, several years ago, uh, there was uh, Hurricane Ivan that hit, well, I think it moved through the Caribbean and then ended up hitting uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Alabama area. So there have been a lot of notorious eye storms. And in fact... This is really a surprising statistic. Um, there have been more I storms that have had the, their name retired than any other letter. And I know it sounds strange. Let me digest this for you for a minute because it is a little confusing. We have a list of hurricane names and they repeat every six years. And if a storm is particularly destructive or deadly, then that name will be retired. For example, this year, we had Tropical Storm Harold that hit South Texas. The reason we had the name Harold is that six years ago, we had Hurricane Harvey. And of course, that name was retired because it was one of the worst storms in history. There have been a lot of notorious A storms, like Hurricane Alicia, and there was a giant Hurricane Allen that hit South Texas, and. Um, Hurricane Agnes way back in the day, and there have been a lot of A storms. There have been a lot of terrible B storms like Hurricane Beulah and Hurricane Betsy. Those are old ones. 
Um, there have been a lot of big sea storms, like one of the strongest ever to hit was Hurricane Camille, which wiped out Mississippi. But when you look at all of the storm names and all of the names that have been retired, there have been more retired I names than any other. And, and one of the reasons for that may be that when you get to that part of the alphabet, they tend to hit in August and in September, which would be the months of the year that we have the strongest, hur well, the tendency to have the strongest hurricanes. I'll put it that way. The Gulf of Mexico really for many years dealt with the ABC storms. It was always A, B, or C. It was always Alicia, it was Beulah, it was Betsy, it was Camille, it was, you know, these, these uh, there was Claudette. I mean, there was different storms that were always A, B, C. Um, Carla, okay, 1961, Hurricane Carla. Uh, but since then, uh, in addition to the ABC storms, we've had a lot of really bad H and, and I storms too. So that's one of the theories you could, you could make is that I storms tend to form in August and September and that, you know, those are the months that are the peak of hurricane season and maybe they have a little bit more of a chance of um, hitting, you know, more populated areas or getting larger, having more time to intensify. I don't think that explains the whole thing though. I really don't. Uh, it may be just a fluke of the fact that we have sort of a small data set, you know, I mean, we've been only been naming hurricanes since 1953. So we've only been doing that for 70 years. So it's a relatively, I mean, if we had two or 300 years to study, maybe it would be a little bit different, but out of the 70 years, there have been a lot of terrible eye storms. So it's just something interesting to think about. So this is going to be the story of the week is going to be uh, likely hurricane uh, Idalia heading toward Florida. Now, of course, my family lives in Florida. So uh, my brother and my mom are down there in the southern part of the state where they're, you guys are probably going to get some rain. Maybe you're going to get a little bit of wind, but you'll miss, obviously, the, the worst of the hurricane. But nevertheless, you know, we always have to be mindful. There can be isolated tornadoes and there could certainly be a rain band that drops some heavy rain. So if you have any travel plans to Florida, for the middle part of this week, you know, please, please keep that in mind. All right, speaking of rain, boy, do we need rain around here. We did have some that moved in last night um, after hitting a record high temperature of 109, which was just insane. We did have some storms come down from the north and that helped a little bit because we actually do have some wildfires. There was a grass fire in spring that threatened some homes. There are some forest fires that are burning in the Piney Woods area uh, around Lufkin and also some very serious fires burning in Louisiana right now. And some of the rain that came down yesterday, I think probably helped. This is the latest drought monitor map that was released last Thursday. And it shows at this point that the majority of the state of Texas is classified as at least abnormally dry. And there's the greatest coverage across the state of Texas as being either severe extreme or exceptional, uh, that's like a category four or five. So there's a greater portion of the state now, or the greatest portion of the state uh, that we've had since 2011. Now back in 2011, it was way worse. I mean, you had from Beaumont to El Paso, from Amarillo to the Valley, it was just extreme exceptional drought, which is why we had such a terrible wild, wildfire season deadly wildfires, and I believe 4 million acres burned uh, in the year 2011. This year, we have that potential if we don't get rain sometime soon. It's not as bad out there right now, but there definitely is that potential um, if we don't get some pretty good rain coming down soon. So that's the latest look at the drought monitor. Here's a closer up view. And notice your, your legend is there at the top. The dark red is called uh, an extreme drought. And then the really dark red is called exceptional. Exceptional is the worst of the worst. And we have that right now for Matagorda County. We have it right now for areas to the east of Houston. So it's becoming a big deal. Like I said, especially since we do have some fires that are breaking out. And uh, a lot of that is taking place over for our friends in Louisiana as well. So um, this is a, you know, it's a pretty serious deal. 
Um, let me just show you what the extended forecast looks like. Uh, we are looking for near 100 today. Pretty good chance for thunderstorms this afternoon. Check your Fox 26 weather app. The rest of the forecast does look pretty hot for the rest of the week. So that is going to intensify our drought uh, for later on this week. Let me let you uh, know that before, before I wrap up here, we are really trying to encourage everybody to check out, just give it a try, the Fox Local app. So um, Amazon Fire TV, Roku TV, Apple TV, um, you can, I think you can get it on Samsung also, but all of those platforms, uh, Amazon, Roku, uh, Apple, and I think um, Samsung, go to the App Store and search Fox Local. Now, sometimes it's easy, and as soon as you type in Fox L, it'll come up. Sometimes you have to spell out the whole thing, Fox space local. But what you'll find there is this, our Fox Local app. And what's really cool about it is um, you download it on your TV and it will either default to Fox 26 or you can select Fox 26 as your home station. And you can watch all of our content, all of our newscasts, all of our extras that come on that are not on the air, um, all of our streams like this one and all of the other ones that we have. Um, but what's also kind of cool is that you can uh, uh, scroll down and you could watch any of the Fox owned stations across the country. Maybe you want to check out the news and see what's happening with the hurricane when it hits Tampa. You can go to Tampa, WTVT. You can go to WOFL in Orlando. You can check out the, uh, the news at, at our Fox owned and operated station in Atlanta or in New York or in Washington, D.C. or uh, you know, in uh, Dallas, you know, wherever you want to go, it's kind of neat because you could just get it on demand and, and check out. Maybe you just want to see how they, you know, sometimes I'll check it out because I want to see what the weather people are doing or see what their newscast looks like. So the Fox local app, go ahead and check it out. Um, I think it's a cool thing. So anyway, that'll do it for Mondays with Mike. Um, stay cool out there. Watch out for some storms late today. And um Keep an eye uh, on that uh, on that hurricane in the Atlantic. It's really amazing to behold, especially since it's not hitting land. So anyway, hi to my mom, hi to my brother, hi to everybody who might be watching me out there in digital land. So we will see you next Monday. And of course, you can catch me Monday through Friday from 4 to 10 a.m. on Wake Up with Sally Mike and Lena and Houston.